you're looking at a very special group of kids who have acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. Could you tell me what was the challenge that you were taking on with this study that you're now reporting? Yes. So at this point, we're able to cure about 90% of children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So there's a lot of focus on that 10% of children who actually relapse. And one subgroup of very high-risk patients is children with the Philadelphia chromosome. Uh, the Philadelphia chromosome uh, is uh, a um, translocation that brings BCR and ABL together. These are two uh, proteins that when they come together dysregulate ABL and cause uh, these cells to become malignant. And that's the same molecular feature as in chronic myeloid leukemia. Very true. It's the same and they've developed these uh, drugs now that, that bind to that abnormal protein and block its activity and these targeted therapies have proven to be very effective. Right, so, so, so basically uh, imatinib is, is an option here, isn't it? But also you've got chemotherapy and the possibility of stem cell transplant. How did those feature in your study? Well, so uh, chemotherapy it has been the way patients have historically been treated with leukemia. Turns out if you use chemotherapy alone in this group of patients, uh, about 30 to about 30 percent of them will be cured so it's a very low cure rate with chemo alone relative to 90 percent with with most uh, children with ALL. Um, a, a stem cell transplant can provide a cure in about 60 percent of the patients but you know that cure is bought with with some risks of dying from the toxicity of the transplant and things like graft-versus-host disease and long-term side effects. Enter imatinib, which of course did well, but now you're looking at dasatinib. Yeah, so the imatinib story is important to know that giving patients imatinib plus intensive chemo has um, provided a cure for about 70% of the patients without a, a stem cell transplant. So that, that was a major home run uh, because you're, you're curing these patients without having the long-term side effects of the transplant. Right, now you're taking that one stage further and you're trying a different TKI, dasatinib. What did you do? So dasatinib, yes, is a, it's a, a drug that has some potential, um, maybe potentially better than imatinib in, at least in, in chronic myelogenous leukemia. It gets patients into remission more quickly uh, it's more effective in tissue culture. It penetrates into the central nervous system better. Um, it also works for resistant, imatinib resistant leukemic clones. So we thought it might be a better drug uh, for, for children with ALL. So what did you do in the study and what did you find? Well, essentially we took dizatinib and we, we paired it with the same intensive chemotherapy backbone that the children's oncology group uh, used with imatinib. And um, we, we really were interested in whether it was feasible to use this combination. So we were looking at the side effect profile and then we're, we're now looking at the long-term outcome in these patients. What did you find? Well, so we found that it was very feasible to use the, the, the uh, dizatinib with intensive chemotherapy. We did have to modify the backbone a little bit in order to make it tolerable. Um, we, we took a dose of high-dose methotrexate out of one of the blocks, and we also altered, we, we took one dose of uh, chemotherapy that was given into the central nervous system. Um, and once we did those two little tweaks to the backbone, um, the, the therapy was very well tolerated. We had no toxic deaths on the study. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody is now in the follow-up phase of their treatments. Now, what about the choice of whether to go with imatinib or to switch to dasatinib? Uh, the mutations come into this, don't they? Yeah, I think the biggest thing right now is that we don't know yet what the long-term outcomes of using dasatinib with this chemo backbone are. Um, at the, in the very short term, uh, at three years, they look pretty similar in terms of the outcomes. But as we're following these patients a little longer, 
uh, you know, we're still seeing patients relapsing on the Dizatinib trial, and those uh, data are not mature yet. So uh, really at this point, imatinib is still the gold standard in, in childhood ALL uh, combined with this chemotherapy backbone um, with longer follow-up. And also there's, there's a nice follow-up study that will provide additional data to help us decide whether to use dizatinib or imatinib um, as the pref preferential tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Right, now you've got a fairly small group, 60 patients, so thereabouts. Yes. What uh, can you now definitely say to doctors, first of all, about the satinib? Looking reasonably good, but needs a bit more evidence. Yeah, I think what we can say is that um, it's safe to give it along with the chemotherapy backbone. We also have kind of confirmed that you can cure patients without transplant. Uh, the prior study showed that, but I think some people were still doubting that. And, you know, our study was in line with what they saw in the prior study where, uh, you know, patients are faring well without transplant. So what's the um, bottom line message to take home from ASCO from your presentation here then for doctors? Yeah, sure. I, I think, you know, this drug is a very promising drug for patients with Philadelphia chromosome positive disease in general. Uh, I think there's a possibility that it's a drug that we will move to in the future. But I think for now, uh, people should uh, be cautious about using it outside of a, a clinical trial setting in children with uh, pH positive ALL.